Hello, students. You know, this season of isolation and social distancing certainly puts some things into perspective. It's so easy to take for granted the ability to leave the house when you want to, to pick up something, just one thing. You don't need to plan ahead and pick up everything that you might need for the next week to two weeks. You can just think, I, I want to buy a case of that soda and go and buy that soda. It's kind of a silly thing, but that freedom, it's, it's intangible, but there's, there's something to it, isn't there? You don't really notice it until there's limitations put on it. Even something as simple as going to work, going to my office at DTS, seeing my friends and coworkers, seeing all of you on a Friday morning, those things easily taken for granted, now I miss them. But it's intangible, yet it's very real. I think you can relate to what I'm talking about. There's surely something with the quarantine and the social distancing that normally you're able to do on a regular basis and now you can't, and there's an angst. There's, there's something unsettling. Well, what we're talking about is something that Plato would have called the forms, idealism. He maybe wouldn't have used the word idealism, but Plato is uh, the father of our understanding of it. So in this video, and I'm probably going to break this up into three or four videos so you can watch it uh, at more reasonable chunks, we're going to take a very high level view of Plato's idealism. We're going to see what that foundation is because every other philosophical system since has to deal with Plato in some way. Even if you completely disagree with his views, as one of his primary students did, you have to take account of Plato. He's that significant of a figure, as we talked about in class last time. So, what is idealism? Idealism, basically, a dictionary definition, the view that mind and spiritual values are fundamental to the world as a whole. And the key there is, is fundamental, using it in a technical sense. That these ideas, these things that aren't tangible, are more significant, more foundational, than any sense of physicality. So idealism has different forms. Uh, through the centuries, we've seen many significant idealistic philosophers. Of course, there's Plato here in the fourth century BC. Uh, we have George Berkeley, not Berkeley, the ball player, but Berkeley in the 18th century, who was an idealist. Uh, Immanuel Kant, also in the 18th century. Hegel in the 19th century. Uh, Herschel in the 20th century. When we think of worldviews and world religions, we can see that Hinduism and Buddhism are very rooted in the principles of idealism. So here are some of the key aspects of idealism when you're considering different philosophies. Uh, one, what is non-material, so spirit, idea, reason, the mind, uh, that is more significant, or another way of saying that, it's more real than matter. The, the body, the, the desk, what is physical, what is observable through the senses. So these non-corporeal, these non-physical things are more real than the things that we can experience with our senses. Another aspect is that the human being is not, or at least not only, a physical material being. Humans have minds, and our minds are not reducible to just the brain or any physical processes. So there's something intangible about the human being. Idealism would assert that. Uh, humans have a free will. We are not entirely determined by, by biological or social factors. Uh, another aspect, knowledge is acquired by using our reason, using our cognitive faculties, not primarily by resting on uh, sense experience or, or observation. It, it's what happens here more than what we observe, see, or sense out here that gives us actual knowledge. 
Another thing that will be generally consistent in different flavors of idealism is that God exists. And God that exists, he is a perfect, uncreated spiritual being who is more fundamental, more foundational, more essential than anything that that being created. It's not necessary that this being be personal, but that it is a fundamental reality that is non-corporeal. And then finally, when we look at the human experience, idealists are going to believe that the human experience, the, the telos of our lives, is to become more and more like the ideal. So whether that's God or the good, the perfect fulfillment of moral law, whatever that might be, that's the telos of the human being. So that's the different flavors of idealism. But we are going to zoom in uh, now on Platonic idealism. So this quote is going to become more significant when we look at Plato's views on education and knowledge. Look at what he says here. True opinions are a fine thing and do all sorts of good as long as they stay in their place. But they will not stay long. They run away. They run away from a man's mind so they are not worth much until you tether them by working out the reason. Once they are tied down, they become knowledge. So notice this, this language of true opinion being different than knowledge. We'll, we'll get more into that in a little bit. See, Plato rejects the, the sophist idea that since truth is relative, knowledge is unattainable. That view, which is skepticism, uh, they doubt that true knowledge is possible at all. Uh, Plato says that, no, there's, there's a difference between believing and knowing. One of the things that people often get frustrated with when having philosophical conversations is we conflate believing, knowing, understanding into one thing. And when we're speaking in philosophical terms, we need to recognize philosophers use these terms separate from one another, and different philosophers will use them in different ways. So we need to understand, we need to define our terms. So for Plato, there's a significant difference between believing and knowing. Belief can fade. Belief can be false. You can have a false belief, while knowledge is always true of what it is. So if you actually possess knowledge, it is true. It can't be false. You can't be mistaken. So the senses will only give you fleeting experiences. What we can see, touch, taste, hear, smell. Only reason can grasp what is. So our opinions move to the side. So we'll get more into that in just a moment. But first, I want to show you uh, one of my favorite paintings. This is the School of Athens. And it was done by Raphael painted in the 16th century, between 1509 and 1511. It's in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican, and the wall that was painted first was the School of Theology, and then this is opposite of it, the School of Athens. Uh, so what is the School of Athens? I mentioned it when we were in class together last time. It was founded by Plato around 387 BC. But it's more than just a school. Sometimes people will say that the academy was uh, the earliest university. Not really. Maybe it was a precursor to what medieval universities would eventually become, but it was more of a community than a school. Uh, it was a community of people who were committed to a shared vision of good moral spiritual practices. So it was a community of ethically aligned people sharing a vision. Now, Plato was the founder and lecturer. What is frustrating is we have no records of his actual lectures or his teaching notes, if he even used teaching notes. All we have are the reactions of his students, uh, most notably Aristotle. That gives us an idea of how he taught and what he taught. A lot of scholars think that Plato, in his lectures to the people in the academy, 
dealt with even more technical and sophisticated ideas than what we have, because we believe we have all of his dialogues, but they were written to more of a broad audience for more of the public group, where his views on who gets to know, as you'll see in a little bit, are fairly tight. So there's a, a pretty, it's fairly likely that he had written some more sophisticated, developed, ahead of his time stuff, but we just don't have a record of it. So one of the reasons I like this painting is when we zoom in, we see these two figures in the center. And these two figures are Plato and his student Aristotle. And we'll talk more about Aristotle next week. But Plato, you see what he's doing. He's, he's pointing up. He's pointing up where we have Aristotle, and he is pointing down. He's saying no. And so what we have here is the teacher, Plato, saying the ideal, that is what matters. That's what's real. The ideas of goodness, of truth, of beauty, justice, that's what's real. All of this, insignificant. That's real. And Aristotle is saying, no, I'm a realist. And what is important, what's real, is only what we can observe with our senses. So these two, student and pupil, radically disagree on the very fundamental nature of the universe. So I appreciate this painting because it gives us one, uh, I would say this is Raphael's masterwork. This is his masterpiece. Uh, two, it's such a nice tight picture of these two major schools of thought. And as we go through these different philosophies in the coming weeks, you're going to see that we are going to be attaching ourselves to idealism and realism. Uh, it's a spectrum, to be certain, but when we understand these two men and their teaching, we'll be able to understand how everyone else is standing on their shoulders and refining the ideas that they introduced. So what Plato's thought is rooted in is his metaphysic and his epistemology and his ethic as well, but we'll get into that. These two, we need to talk about them together. If you want to understand Platonism, this may not be strictly Plato, but Platonism in general, you're going to have some form, no pun intended, of what you see on the screen. The theory of the forms and the immor immortality of the soul. So what are these two things? Well, what is truly real are the forms. And so what does that mean? They, they are completely unchangeable. They are not spatially or temporally located. So talking about goodness or justice, well, where can you find it? it it's intangible and they are unchangeable. Uh, particular objects in the material world, like us, uh, we simply imitate or at best participate in the forms. And I'll talk more about that participation in a second. Now, human persons have a connection to this, <laughs> this higher uh, spiritual reality. That The human soul is an invisible spiritual reality itself that possesses an ability to know the forms because it existed in that realm prior to coming into the body. And we talked about this last time, that forgetfulness, that in birth we forget that which we once knew. The reason we knew it is because the, the soul is immortal. And the soul participated fully in the ideal realm, the realm of the forms. Uh, so almost every form of idealism, or I'm sorry, every form of Platonism holds to these two pillars in relationship with one another in some way. So, as I said, these, these human beings, us, we have a connection. Because of our immortality, we can recall the forms. So education, this is Socrates, Plato quoted him as saying, he viewed himself not as a teacher, but as a midwife for knowledge. He is delivering that which is already known. People simply need to recollect it. Let me give you an illustration of, of how these things work. So this silhouette on your screen, I'm gonna call him Clark. So Clark is a guy, he is a particular person. And when we think about Clark, the thing that jumps to mind most is his courage. 
he is a courageous person. He is a courageous person who does courageous things, but neither Clark or those things are identical with courage itself. Clark may become a coward, but courage remains courage. Uh, there are other courageous people doing courageous things. So Plato believed that there must be a common element that all these courageous people and all these courageous acts share. They all share in or participate in courage. So courage then is a form. It is a kind of ideal that particular things can participate in to some degree or another. Does that follow? Uh, so courage is this eternal, unchangeable reality that must be distinguished from all the particular objects and actions that participate in it. So Clark isn't identical to courage. He's one who has courage. But Clark is still Clark without courage. And if Clark becomes slightly fearful, but still pretty brave, well, that's him diminishing how he participates in the unchangeable reality of courage. It's, we are always changing and our participation in it is always in flux. So the particular, Clark, gets some of its reality from the form, courage. The particular, Clark, is enhanced by the form, but the form, is in no way diminished by the particular's participation. So that's one way that we can think about this idea of the forms. I'm going to try presenting it in a couple of different ways so that you can understand this platonic idea, and again, no pun intended, as we build forward the rest of the semester. So like Heraclitus, who we didn't talk about the pre-Socratics, but he's one who believed that the universe is in a state of constant flux. You might remember the quote, or you may have heard someone say, it's impossible to step in the same stream twice because the water is always rushing, so you will never be able to experience that again. Uh, that's something that Plato agrees with, that, that the physical world the world that we experience through perception is in constant flux. But he also agrees with Parmenides, who said, genuine knowledge must be knowledge of being. And that's a capital B, being. The, this knowledge which is constant and unchangeable. So that's knowledge. Our perceptions aren't, can't be. All right. So... I'm going to pause this video now and get some coffee.